When Jesus met the woman at Jacob's well, he said it in hour, a sweet message to tell. The woman come in wondering, cause she seen he was a Jew. He came to draw men under him. Oh, lift him up, that's all. Lift him up. Good anyway. morning, everyone. If you uh, it's tell morning the name for of me Jesus at the moment. I don't know if it is for you. If you uh, but welcome again it. to Historian Splaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures can be found on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. And uh, if you want to keep hearing them, I encourage you, again, look at my Patreon page, also under Historian Splaining, and see if you might be able to contribute anything to make sure these lectures uh, keep coming regularly and with good quality and research. So as I said, I'm going to talk about the historical Jesus. But before I get uh, into that, I'm going to first stop and ask you a question. I'm going to ask about a person that I'm sure all of you have heard of, and that's George Washington. And I'm going to ask you, can you think right now in your mind of a story about George Washington that you could tell if someone asked you for one? Well, probably a lot of you uh, might be thinking of incidents in the Revolutionary War or in his presidency, but an easy one that comes to mind quickly and that you'd probably be able to tell right away if you were in a pinch is the story about his father's cherry tree that once, uh, sort of for fun or for unknown reasons, when he was a child, George Washington chopped down his father's favorite cherry tree and when his father started asking uh, who did it, George confessed because he could not tell a lie. Nice, easy uh, little story encapsulates a certain sense of George Washington's character, tells us also a little bit about his background, his upbringing. Well, uh, the story is not true. Uh, it was never told during Washington's own lifetime. We know that it was invented later by moralistic writers who wanted to sort of use George Washington as a kind of example of moral virtue for young Americans. So what we're seeing happening with George Washington right here is the creation of a mythology, right? A constellation of stories and ideas around a certain person that we think say something important about that person or about ourselves and our relationship to that person. Uh, a lot of other facts that might come to mind about Washington that that you may have heard and that I may have mentioned before. Uh, for example, George Washington had wooden teeth. Uh, also not true. You know, a lot of what we think and say every day about George Washington isn't true. And this is the case with a person about whom we know quite a lot. Uh, you know, George Washington is not an obscure figure to us. He uh, is not ancient history. It wasn't that long ago. And we have plenty of written records, plenty of written records about George Washington. We know about his upbringing, his military service. We have his own writings. We have images of him painted uh, from life. We really have a lot of information about him, and yet, nonetheless, a lot of what we say about him is false, is mythology that we choose to perpetuate, even though it isn't factual. Well, if we consider Jesus, whom I said before is one of the great enigmas, I think, in all of history, what we have about Jesus is stories that were told about him later, after he had died. And the earliest records we have about him come from a few decades after he died. We don't have any documents about him from his own lifetime. And so if we want to know anything about who he was or what he did or what he said, we have to somehow puzzle it out through these later sources that are heavily laden with mythology, right? With stories that were told about him 
by his followers and followers of his followers about what they remembered and what they thought was valuable to say about him. And none of the sources that we have about him are very historically reliable, right? Everything, almost everything that is said about him in our earliest sources is open to question, right? He is a great enigma. He is a great mystery. And trying to understand who that person was and what he did is a real complicated puzzle. You'll often hear people make pronouncements, both religious people and non-religious, will often make pronouncements like, well, you know, Jesus was really about X. Jesus was really about helping the poor, or Jesus really said X or Y. Okay, even if you have read the Bible, which most of us have not, even if you have sat down and read through the Bible, including the New Testament, even then, you cannot know with confidence exactly what Jesus said and did. It's an extremely complicated, multi-layered uh, uh, challenge to figure out who this person was. And, and on top of that, how such an individual could have had such a, a huge uh, resounding, uh, magnifying impact on the history of, of thought, philosophy, civilization, and human history. So as I said, Jesus was an obscure individual. He was a Jewish peasant. Uh, he was almost surely illiterate. We have no evidence to suggest that he was, that he was literate. Uh, we have no writings from him nor any writings directly from anyone who knew him in person. And this is, uh, you know, should have been clear from my, from my last lecture, as I said many times, uh, none of the New Testament writings are penned by eyewitnesses who knew Jesus in person. And as of today, we don't have any other writings available to us from any other sort of source, from penned by anyone who knew him in person. You know, not only was uh, Jesus himself illiterate, but surely the vast majority of his followers were too. It shouldn't be surprising that we have no sources directly about or from Jesus or his closest followers. Um, if we look at the time when Jesus lived, uh, sort of just before the height of the Roman Empire, the empire was overwhelmingly composed of illiterate peasants. Okay, Jesus was just one among millions. And most of the evidence we have about the existence of this vast population of peasants comes from archaeology, from fragments they've left behind of their everyday objects, their, their farming tools, uh, their homes. Uh, and most of them, we know nothing about them what their names were, what they did. Uh, even Roman uh, imperial records tell us very little. They're concerned largely with tax revenues and the ability to raise armies. There was never an empire-wide census. There was never a concerted effort to even tabulate the population beyond certain local areas for certain limited purposes. So if we were to pick any random individual living in the Roman Empire at its height, we uh, can say very little about them. There are some exceptions. For example, there was a custom in Egypt of scribes making birth certificates and marriage certificates uh, for even for ordinary people, but that was not an empire-wide custom. These people were not bureaucratically tracked and counted and recorded in the way that we are today in the modern Western world. Even when we talk about prominent people, okay, and there are some significant prominent individuals who appear in the New Testament, people like uh, King Herod, for instance, even for them, there's often very little record about them. There might be a couple of references in a couple of writings by senators or historians like Tacitus, and um, and even for some important officials, we have no record about who they are or what they did. 
uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about Pontius Pilate, uh, who was so unknown in the surviving records that it was even open to doubt whether he really existed until recently, until the 20th century. And I'll mention that more uh, later. So if we want to know about Jesus, we have to look at the limited set of sources that we have, all of which, as I said, come from after this person died. We have uh, the Christian epistles, most importantly the epistles of Paul, which are the earliest Christian writings we have, and they are the earliest documents we have that make any reference to the existence of such a person as Jesus. Uh, Paul refers to Jesus repeatedly as being a Jewish man, uh, quote, born under the law, meaning he was born uh, as a Jew, subject to Jewish law, who was uh, crucified by the Roman authorities, who was buried, and who rose from the dead. Uh, Paul also refers to Jesus as a Messiah. Uh, and Messiah, you know, is an important uh, word in discussing the historical Jesus, not necessarily because Jesus used it himself. It's actually dubious whether Jesus ever used that term himself, but it was used by all of his followers over and over again, uh, and it overwrites the way that they talk about and portray Jesus. So Jesus' followers considered him a Messiah, and Messiah is simply a form of the Hebrew word Moshiach, which means the Anointed One. And what it actually means, in effect, is a divinely chosen, divinely sanctioned leader of the Jews, right? And it had been used in the Hebrew Scriptures to refer to a king of the Jews, like David or Solomon, or even a non-Jewish king, whom they believed to be uh, chosen and empowered by God, such as uh, Cyrus, the Persian emperor, was also referred to as a Moshiach, an anointed leader. Well, while the Jewish people were under foreign rule, the belief circulated that at some point a leader would arise again, who would be chosen and empowered by God to lead the Jews and to overthrow foreign rule, and so free the Jews from foreign uh, oppression. And uh, anticipation of a new Messiah was common, for example, in the Roman period. Uh, and also in the Roman period, this notion that a Messiah would at some point appear to lead the Jews also became connected to apocalypticism and the idea that there would be a sort of final overthrow of all human governments, an end to the world as people knew it at that time and the beginning of a millennium uh, of peace and of rule by God. Okay, so, so these are all basic claims we see in Paul's epistles. A Jewish man who preached, who was crucified, who was buried, who rose from the dead, and who is the Messiah. Specifically in Galatians, we also see Paul refer to a trip that he took to Jerusalem, where he met with Peter, who was a close follower and disciple of Jesus, and also with, quote, James, the brother of the Lord. Okay, and, and so this is, this is our earliest reference to Jesus having a brother. And uh, this, this notion that Jesus had a brother named James appears again in other, uh, in other writings in the New Testament, and it also appears in Josephus. So Josephus, I mentioned briefly when I talked about Judaism, Josephus was an important a Jewish historian who wrote Antiquities of the Jews in the 90s AD, so maybe around 60 years or so after Jesus had died. Uh, and Josephus gives us a very rich, complicated portrait of Jews and Judaism in the Second Temple period. And Josephus re refers to Jesus twice. So Josephus is our earliest non-Christian writer who mentions Jesus. And at one point, Josephus uh, recalls that, quote, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, met his death after the death of the procur procurator Porcius Festus. So 
Uh, so here we have this early reference to, to a person named James who was the brother of Jesus. And it says that this, Jesus, this person, Jesus, was also called Christ. So this is one of our, our earliest references to this title of Christ. And Christ, it, it's used in the New Testament as well. Christ is simply the Greek translation of Messiah. Right? Messiah uh, means the anointed one in Hebrew. Uh, Christ simply is the word for the anointed in Greek. Uh, so we have uh, Josephus referring to Jesus and his brother James. And, uh, and Josephus also has another reference to the existence of Jesus, which I will uh, come back to later. But basically, this is to say that there are a few key claims made about Jesus that we see in the epistles of Paul. And some of them are corroborated in other sources. So this, this claim about James appears in Josephus, and also the same basic claims about Jesus and who he was appear in the four canonical Gospels. Right? We have uh, the earliest Gospel, Mark, written around AD 70, Matthew and Luke a bit later, and finally John was writing maybe around the same time as Josephus or a little later, at the end of the first century. And these uh, four Gospels, as I mentioned in my lecture about the New Testament, these four Gospels each portray Jesus a little differently. In Mark, we see Jesus portrayed in the most human uh, fashion. There's no reference to the virgin birth. Uh, he's presented as a human being with emotions and passions and attachments who performs miracles and healings uh, and eventually is uh, arrested uh, condemned and crucified. We then have uh, the later Gospels, which emphasize more Jesus's divinity, portray him uh, surrounded by angels, uh, refer to him many times as the Messiah. And finally, in John, the last canonical Gospel to be written, Jesus himself says that he is the Messiah. Right. So where this is only hinted at and, and um, implied and intimated in Mark, it is explicitly put into Jesus' own mouth in John, right? So as we go through those four Gospels, we see uh, Jesus taking on a more and more explicitly divine character. We also see uh, a reference to Jesus, which refers to him as the Christ or the Messiah in Josephus. So there's a passage in Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews which is describing the period of time in the early first century when Judea was under the government of the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate. Although he doesn't refer to him as a prefect, but that's a different story. Uh, and in this passage in Josephus, so this Jewish historian is describing this period of time, Josephus says, quote, About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds, and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, he has still to this day not disappeared. Okay, so this little passage in Josephus, which gives us a description of Jesus and his career and of his group, what we call the church, is controversial. We don't have any original surviving copies of Josephus going back to the time when he wrote it. We only have later copies. And scholars have argued that this passage was all interpolated, right? That it was, it was not actually written by Josephus, but that some later Christian author stuck it in there into the copies of Josephus's Antiquities as a way of reinforcing and bolstering the importance of Jesus, 
who in fact was a very obscure individual whom most important people at the time hardly took any notice of. Well, one of the problems with this idea that this passage in Josephus is just an interpolation is that if we look at the opening sentences, uh, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed we're not to call him a man, uh, these opening lines are very much in line with the style and common phrases and words that Josephus uses. And it does make sense historically if we consider that by the time, by the AD 90s, when Josephus was writing, uh, the Christian group had grown somewhat large by this point. It was a noticeable presence uh, by this time, both in Judea and in the Greek-speaking parts of the empire. It makes sense that the, that opening part may have really been written by Josephus. Uh, and so... Today, the largest, it's not a consensus, it's still controversial, but the largest number of scholars tend to agree that these first few sentences, about this time there lived Jesus a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. They argue that that part was really written by Josephus. Then the rest of it was added in beginning with, he was the Messiah. You know, if, if Josephus really thought that Jesus was the Messiah, he probably would have put that up front. <laughs> and he probably would have put it at the beginning of his book. <laughs> it would be the most important fact in the whole history, uh, that there was, a, there was a Jewish Messiah. So today most scholars tend to think that that, uh, beginning with that line, the rest is interpolated. It was added in by somebody later who wanted to say uh, Jesus uh, died on the cross, rose from uh, the, the dead and was restored to life, appeared to his followers, and so forth. Uh, so these basic sort of central uh, teachings, central beliefs of the Christian church were added in uh, and sort of put into Josephus' mouth. But all in all, we can take this, uh, this uh, short little passage from Josephus that scholars mostly think is authentic, we can take that little reference as simple, simply a corroboration of just the existence of a person called Jesus uh, who was believed to have performed uh, miracles and feats, who was a teacher, and who had both Jewish and Gentile followers. Right. So Josephus is our most important early non-Jewish, uh, excuse me, non-Christian uh, source for basic facts about Jesus. And we can put that little testimony uh, alongside our sources in the epistles of Paul and the four Gospels that we see in the New Testament. Later, after Josephus, there are some other Gentile writers who make reference to Jesus. Uh, there's Tacitus, the Roman senator and historian in the second century, some other later Roman writers, and eventually, a few hundred years later, there's also the Talmud, which briefly refers to Jesus and says that uh, something, you know, very dismissive, that, you know, he was the child of a Jewish woman and a Greek soldier, and to cover this up, uh, the mother said that the, he was fathered by God. Uh, y y so... That comes from hundreds of years later. It's coming from a time when there was contention and disagreement between Jews and Christians. And, uh, you know, these later references are not really so historically helpful or illuminating because so much change and distortion could have happened over the intervening years, and they don't really tell us much. For example, Tacitus basically just says there was a guy named Jesus. He had followers who considered him a, a savior figure, and and there's a cult that... that uh, reveres him as, as a savior. So it doesn't really tell us much about the person himself. There are also, as you've probably heard, lastly I'll, I'll say a few words about other later Christian writings. So the earliest Christian writings we have are the epistles of Paul, the canonical gospels in the New Testament are also very early from within the first century. But then there are other later Christian writings from other Christian groups and communities in the Roman Empire 
that have survived to today, but that were not widely known in the Middle Ages and the modern world, and that were not included in the New Testament canon. Uh, the most important of them uh, are a collection of early Christian writings that we call the Nag Hammadi Library. And it's called that because a shepherd, a young shepherd in Egypt, outside the town of Nag Hammadi in Egypt, found them buried in a pit in, I believe, 1945, if I remember the date correctly, around the same time that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, a, young, a young Egyptian found the Nag Hammadi Library and started to sort of pull them out of the ground and sell them and circulate them, and eventually academics and archaeologists found them. And we can examine them. And uh, the Nag Hammadi Library apparently was buried there in the desert, probably in the 4th century. We don't know exactly when or exactly why, but probably it was because at that time uh, these non-canonical Christian writings were being suppressed and condemned by the church. And so somebody who had a collection of them decided to preserve them by hiding them in the desert. And they were found, you know, more than 1,500 years later. These Christian writings date from the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. Uh, they were written mostly in Coptic, the ancient Egyptian language, which is still used in the Coptic Christian Church in Egypt. And they are mostly Gnostic, okay? And I'm not going to get too into Gnosticism right now, but it's a, it's a form of Christian th thought which emphasizes spiritual knowledge and the sort of liberation of the soul from the material into the spiritual realm. So it's an alternative way of understanding Christianity that was common in certain areas, especially Egypt and North Africa, in these early centuries, before it was gradually suppressed in favor of Orthodox Christianity. And as part of that, these Coptic uh, Gnostic writings were suppressed. We didn't know anything about what Gnostics believed until, really, in, almost nothing, until the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered. We knew a little bit about what the Christian leaders in Rome who opposed them said about them, but we didn't really know their own writings or their own teachings until the Nag Hammadi Library. Most of the uh, Gospels that you find in the Nag Hammadi Library that talk about Jesus come from much later than the canonical Gospels in the Bible. So these, you know, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Judas, they're very interesting. They provide great insights into what some early Christians were thinking, but it's very unlikely that they tell us any facts about Jesus beyond what we already see in the other Gospels. However, there is one document in the Nag Hammadi Library, which scholars call the Coptic Gospel of Thomas which is pretty clearly the earliest and oldest document in the library. And it probably was written, it's estimated to be written around 100 AD. So we could say uh, possibly about the same time that the Gospel of John was written. So this is one document in the Nag Hammadi Library that, that goes back very far in time to possibly within the time period when people who had known Jesus personally might have still been living. And uh, it's possible that there might be something historical in it. The Coptic Gospel of Thomas doesn't tell us a narrative of Jesus' life. Rather, it's like the hypothetical Q document. It's basically just a collection of utterances. Jesus said X. Jesus said Y. Right? And it makes sense that it might have been written in that period at a time when people basically knew the storyline of Jesus' life. But what they felt the need to write down and preserve was specific things he had said. Right? So it's a collection of utterances attributed to, to Jesus. And there's, it's possible that it might be a source of real information about, uh, historical information about what Jesus actually said. So these are basically the sources we have to work with. Brief references in a few 
non-Christian uh, writings, Josephus being the most significant, the Epistles of Paul, the other New Testament epistles, the four canonical Gospels, and the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. All of these are questionable sources. It is impossible to simply say, well, those, those are the sources that tell us about Jesus, and therefore we know what he said and what he did, because the Gospels contradict each other. Right? They are in, they're inconsistent. I've talked already about how different Gospels give us very different point of views, points of view about Jesus and who he was, right? and they portray him in different ways. But there are even direct contradictions. For instance, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the three synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, say that Jesus' ministry from when he began preaching with John the Baptist's group up until he went to Jerusalem and died was a little over one year. According to the Gospel of John, it was three years. Right? Can't have it both ways. One doesn't equal three. Somebody has to be mistaken, right? Likewise, if you look at the uh, resurrection of Christ and you ask in each of the Gospels, how did Jesus' followers know that he had risen from the dead? Well, all of them say that at some point, some follower or followers went to the tomb and, f and saw something that told them Jesus had risen from the dead. But they all say something different. You know, Mark says the tomb was simply empty. Matthew says there was an angel. Uh, Luke and John say there was something more than an angel. Jesus himself was there, or Jesus was there, but he was like reaching up to the sky. You know, each one says something different about what was found in the tomb. They can't all be correct. They contradict each other. Okay, so people have long known about these contradictions and you know and this is why there's this term synoptic gospels is because for centuries people have looked at the gospels and said well they're not consistent they have differences and three of them look very similar and have a lot of the same claims in them mark matthew and luke and john is quite different and scholars have generally thought that uh, John most likely was written by a separate community based on separate sources and traditions who knew nothing about the synoptic gospels, right? They're independent of each other. Some scholars have questioned that, but certainly if you compare them, John is very different, and there is no passage in John that exactly matches anything in the other gospels. They were certainly written completely separately. Beginning in the 19th century, scholars began to analyze the Gospels and other early references to Jesus to try to see if they could determine the actual historical facts, uh, doing a sort of investigation, a kind of crime scene investigation. Can we figure out what actually happened and what this person really did and said? So that was the beginning of what we call the first quest for the historical Jesus. And it's sort of an awkward term. It's a little ambiguous, but it's a phrase that's now used for uh, periods of time when generations of scholars and intellectuals try to find. They sort of go on the quest to look for the historical Jesus. The first kind of definitive, uh, really impactful work putting forward an argument about the historical Jesus and who he really was, was written by Albert Schweitzer. Okay, and maybe you've heard the name. Albert Schweitzer was uh, a doctor, a physician, a missionary who set up uh, a hospital in Africa uh, in an underserved area. He also was an organ player and organ composer and uh, one of the sort of foremost uh, pipe organ performers in Europe when he was studying in Europe. And, and he was actually uh, composing and performing organ music at the same time he was getting his medical degree and he began working on his book about the historical Jesus called The Quest of the Historical Jesus. So he was quite a multi-talented guy. <laughs> And Schweitzer put forward a very uh, distinctive and striking argument where he uh, looked at the different utterances of Jesus 
recorded in in the New Testament, and he tried to sort out which ones were most likely to be historical and real. And he basically came to the conclusion that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet, that the main thrust of his message was that an apocalypse was coming and that his followers should prepare for the end of the world as they knew it and the approaching kingdom of God. Okay, Schweitzer argues that this apocalyptic prophet, this, this real historical Jesus, is quite different from the Jesus who is worshipped as the Messiah in Christianity. That he was not, you know, just a, a sort of passive, nonviolent, self-sacrificing uh, sort of lamb of God uh, who relieves people or, you know, expiates people's sins. Uh, so he argued that, that the real historical Jesus wasn't the Jesus Christ that Christians prefer to imagine. But he argued uh, Christians should still believe in the religious Christ, the theological Christ that they knew from the church anyway, that they should believe it as a matter of faith, even though it does not correspond to actual historical facts. And as he saw it, his life as a missionary and as a doctor was acting out his sort of Christian uh, witness and following the model of the Christian Christ, even though it wasn't the historical Jesus. Okay, I'll mention that again later, but this is the first sort of landmark in the early quest for the historical Jesus. A new quest for the historical Jesus arose again later in the 1960s and 1970s, partly because of the discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library that uh, you know, greatly enlarged and diversified our knowledge of Second Temple period Judaism and the early church. So a, a sort of new quest arose in the 1960s and 70s, and a certain collection of scholars interested in the historical Jesus, organized at that time and formed a group called the Jesus Seminar. And the work of the Jesus Seminar uh, has also been very influential and was certainly important, but has been questioned as well uh, in, the, in the years since then. So the Jesus Seminar did things like they would hold meetings and they would uh, comb through the Gospels in the New Testament, and particularly pick out all the utterances attributed to Jesus, and they would then vote on which ones they thought were most likely to be historically authentic. And they even created an edition of the Bible, where Jesus' various words were color-coded according to how likely the Jesus Seminar thought they were to be real utterances that Jesus really said. And you find that, I, you know, I, I don't remember exactly, I think they use black for the most likely to be, you know, ones that they are confident Jesus really said. And it's only about 16% of all of the words attributed to Jesus in the New Testament are colored black, meaning very likely to be authentic. And the rest are various gradations of likelihood. And most of it is simply um, not, not verifiable and not likely to be real historical utterances. Okay. So the Jesus Seminar was a sort of concerted effort to sort out what was historically reliable and what wasn't. The tendency that you see when you look at the work of the Jesus Seminar is that it tends to create a very non-divine Jesus, a Jesus who was concerned with worldly social and material affairs, who did not talk all that much about his own divinity or, or the kingdom of God, and who tended to express progressive social views. Who, you know, the, the Jesus Seminar tends to lean towards giving more credence to his words and actions that seem to reflect a belief in equality, inclusion, inclusion of women. And it's certainly possible that that's true. You know, there there is good evidence that Jesus was concerned with including women and uh, you know, 
disabled people, lepers, you know, pe prostitutes, people who had been socially excluded, that he wanted to bring them into his circle of followers. So that's not an outrageous view, but, but you can see maybe a bit of a bias on the part of the Jesus Seminar, that they sort of want to make Jesus in their own image. They want him to reflect the sort of views and values that they have. Right? And this is the common pattern that we see all the time among scholars and non-scholars, too, that people want to project onto Jesus good sentiments, good ideas that they agree with, and they want Jesus to be in their own image. Well, the work of the Jesus Seminar has been heavily revised, and I'll talk a little bit about more current scholarship and how ideas have changed over the last few years. Uh, so they've been revised, but not entirely thrown out. You know, the Jesus Seminar's work is still seen as, as a decent starting point for sorting through what we can say about the historical Jesus. In more recent work, you know, we, we see within I, about the past 20 or 25 years a sort of another gradual growth in interest in the historical Jesus. And uh, a lot of it... Uh, so the, a lot of it has produced some very strong and persuasive new scholarship, and also a lot of it is sort of popular scholarship that's basically junk. Uh, it's very easy when you look through the mass of material about Jesus, particularly in the Gospels, it's very easy to cherry pick. You know, there are so many a actions and utterances attributed to Jesus, many of which are contradictory in the different Gospels, that it's very easy to cherry pick and simply uh, create the picture of Jesus that you prefer for one reason or another. Uh, you may have heard a few years ago of Reza Aslan's book about the historical Jesus called Zealot, where he basically argues that Jesus was not this passive, uh, you know, pacifist uh, sage, but rather was a kind of political radical trying to, you know, cause trouble. And he basically cherry picks the sort of most aggressive words and actions that you can attribute to Jesus and pieces that, uh, that image together. Well, you know, if you go about it that way, you can basically make any Jesus you want, just about. Um, and, uh, you know, Zealot w was not very, you know, did not wow the New Testament experts. And, uh, and you might remember there was an interesting little sort of tiff where... Uh, uh, Reza Aslan went on Fox News to talk about his book, and the interviewer questioned him, you know, since you're a Muslim, why would you write about this Christian leader? You know, how is that your business? And uh, Reza Aslan responds by saying, you know, I'm, I'm a scholar, which is perfectly valid, and saying, I, I, you know, I have degrees in New Testament studies and biblical studies and ancient Greek and so on, and all of which was lies. He does not have any such degrees. Uh, you know, he studied religious studies, and his research was on modern uh, Islam uh, and, you know, Islamic extremism. Uh, so, you know, take that as you will. You know, how does that reflect on Reza Aslan's uh, scholarly integrity? Uh, and you might remember also, for, for good measure, uh, Bill O'Reilly in his book, uh, uh, Killing Jesus. Um, you know, he's very interested in killing. Uh, it's his favorite uh, topic. And... Um, O'Reilly was criticized for the way he, uh, he also cherry-picked which utterances by Jesus he took seriously and which ones he dismissed. Uh, and when he considered uh, Jesus on the cross and his words on the cross, he chose to uh, reject the, uh, the line attributed to him, uh, you know, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do because he said uh, that you couldn't have heard from the ground what Jesus was saying when he was up on the cross. It could be true. It's a, you know, it's a valid point. Uh, but he embraces as authentic uh, the utterances by Jesus uh, where he, uh, you know, curses and complains about the Jews, right? Uh, so he's cherry-picking um, the particular lines in the New Testament that basically make the, cast the Jews in a more negative light. And he is rejecting the ones that express, you know, forgiveness or understanding. Uh, so 
Again, just another you know, recent example of the way people can easily distort and create the story of Jesus that, that fits their ideology. Okay, now as I said, there is recent uh, scholarship, for example, by Bart Ehrman, who is probably the most prominent uh, scholar today focused on uh, the historical Jesus. Uh, there are others. And among the recent generation of scholars, you might say in the current quest for the historical Jesus, there are two broad trends that we can identify that I'll point out. One is that scholars are tending to gravitate back to the idea that Jesus was basically an apocalyptic prophet. That if we look at the specific words of Jesus that have historical credibility, they tend to cast him as a prophet, foreseeing the appearance of a son of man, which means uh, a servant of humankind sent by God, who would usher in the direct rule of God. So basically, Albert Schweitzer was right. <laughs> um, certainly, scholars today wouldn't agree with Schweitzer about all the details and fine points, uh, you know, he wasn't right about everything, but his basic view that he came to from this very, you know, careful and uncompromising intellectual analytical standpoint was basically correct. Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet, and that's how his immediate followers understood him. And the second trend that I'll point out is that scholars are finding that more material in the New Testament Gospels is actually credible than they had previously thought. There are many lines and uh, incidents recalled in the New Testament Gospels that scholars for decades dismissed as very unlikely to have any credence or to be most likely false. And that as scholarship and particularly archaeology in uh, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, Judea advances and expands our knowledge of the environment in which Jesus lived, more of these incidents and utterances are actually being corroborated. So if you were to ask a, a sort of impartial scholar today how much material in the New Testament is likely to have historical truth to it, or historical accuracy to it, it would be more, it would be a larger portion than they might have said 50 years ago. And uh, that might be a controversial statement, you know, people hate making generalizations and, you know, no one wants uh, to sort of be caught being gullible or giving too much credence to dubious sources, but that's the pattern that we can observe when we look through uh, the details of how this scholarship has developed. Okay, so that's a little rundown of what our sources are and the way generations of people have gone about uh, drawing conclusions about the historical Jesus. Okay, how, how do you do that properly? What, what do historians do with historical sources and documents? that a good historian ought to do when they look at a document like the Gospel of Mark or the Epistles of Paul. How do you figure out, when looking at an unreliable source, how do you figure out what the facts are and what reliable information you might be able to draw out of a historical source? Well, one of the, ba the probably the first criterion is you look for the earliest sources you can, closest to the events that they claim to describe. There is less likely, all other things being equal, there's less likely to be distortion and fabrication in an earlier document, closer to the event than later. So, so one important criterion is, is a claim attested early, how early? Another is, is a claim corroborated by independent sources, right? So, for example, if we see a claim about Jesus, uh, like he walked on water, and it appears in Mark, uh, 
uh, and then it appears also in the Gospel of John, well, that tells us something interesting because Mark and John are two separate sources written by different people independently. And if both of them make an assertion consistent with one another, that gives it much greater weight and, and credence. Uh, so it's just like if an incident happens and, uh, and there are supposedly eyewitnesses, you, one of the things you want to ask is, is there consistency between the accounts of the different eyewitnesses? Do they tell us the same thing? And do they tell us that independently? Right? If they confer with each other, then it doesn't mean as much because one witness might simply be passing on a claim to the other one. So if we see a claim about Jesus and it appears in Mark and then in Matthew, that doesn't tell us that much because we know that Matthew had Mark. Right? It could have just been copied over. But if it's in Mark and John, or it's in John and uh, Tacitus, that tells us a bit more. And I already sort of gave an example of this earlier when I said Paul refers to meeting James, the brother of the Lord. And then Josephus also refers to a person named James who was the brother of Jesus called Christ, right? So this is a basic little biographical claim about Jesus that appears in two separate independent sources who have totally different points of view. These different corroborating independent sources that we look to and compare against each other can be textual, like comparing two Gospels against each other. They can also be archaeological, right? Uh, so, you know, if, if we were to see a claim in, in a Gospel like, uh, you know, G Jesus uh, preached in Jerusalem, which is located on an island, you know, we, we know that Jerusalem was not on an island. It was never on an island, right? So we have archaeological sources contradicting the textual source. And that, you know, puts the documentary source into extreme doubt. But if we have archaeology corroborating things said in our documents, that is another way of finding independent attestations that support each other. And that has happened especially in recent years, this has happened more and more with our early documents about Jesus that we found corroborating sources archaeologically. And uh, lastly, uh, the, when we look at a document, we of course have to consider what is the ideological agenda and viewpoint of the people who wrote this document. What, what were their views and what were they trying to get across? And if we see a claim in a document that aligns with and supports the ideological agenda of the author, then that gives it less credence, right? It's, it's easy, again, it's easy to cherry pick things you've heard or seen or even make things up that support the point you're trying to make, right? And if, if we say, for example, uh, the Gospel of Luke is trying to present Jesus as a kind of stoic, uh, wise man, teaching his followers, then uh, a story in Luke that shows Jesus as a sort of stoic wise man teaching his followers doesn't have a lot of weight to it, right? It would have been easy for them to sort of imagine it or exaggerate it to further the portrait they're trying to paint, right? Whereas if a claim in a document goes against the agenda that, uh, that the author is trying to advance, then it has much greater credence, right? And often the strongest, most reliable uh, facts that you can find out of a document are the ones that stick out because they don't fit with the overall ideological viewpoint. And so they are most likely to be there because the author really believed they were true and felt obligated to include them because they knew that they were true, whether or not it fit the ideological point they're trying to make. Right. So if we see, uh, for example, if we were to look in uh, in John, uh, where we have uh, this this portrait of Jesus as a divine being, as the logos embodied, and it was to say, oh, Jesus, you know, ate something and got sick. Uh, that doesn't really fit with the picture of Jesus as this sort of otherworldly divine being. It makes him seem much more like a flesh and blood ordinary human. So that's just one hypothetical example 
of where you might see a claim in a document and give it more weight because it works against the ideological agenda. Okay, so if those are our basic criteria that we're using to examine these documents and see what we can figure out about the historical Jesus, what we can do is say, okay, let's look at all these claims that are made about Jesus, who he was, where he came from, what he did, uh, how he died, where he ended up after death, and so on. And we ask which ones of them are attested early, particularly in Mark, which is our earliest source, which ones are attested consistently across different independent sources, which ones are corroborated by our knowledge of the time and place, whether from other historical sources or archaeology, and which ones are consistently attested even though they don't fit the ideological agendas of these early church writers we can come we can sort our claims about Jesus into two basic baskets right the first basket is a big basket it's the basket of weak claims claims that don't hold up as being very likely to be accurate right ones that uh, are inconsistent from one doc from one document to another including from one gospel to another that aren't independently corroborated, that aren't attested early, uh, that aren't in line with the other knowledge we have from history and archaeology. Into that basket, we can put all kinds of claims about Jesus, such as the virgin birth, right? It doesn't appear in Mark. And uh, you would think if Mark, you know, if it was true, that Mark would probably know about it and include it, but he doesn't. He or she does not. Uh, the various miracles, you know, Jesus performs all kinds of healings. Uh, he turns water into wine. He walks on water. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, all the Gospels all assert that Jesus performed miracles that made a great impression on witnesses. So we can say that, you know, we very early on people believed that Jesus had done miraculous things. However, the miracles are all inconsistent from one Gospel to another, right? For example, the water into wine and raising Lazarus from the dead only appear in the Gospel of John. And you would think that if Jesus had raised one of his dead friends, resurrected him from the dead, again, you would think the earlier Gospels might mention this, but they don't. Uh, so, so most of those miracles, you know, they're all over the map. They're not consistent from one document to another. Uh, and they're not corroborated by any other sources. And it would have been easy for authors to embellish or add in or exaggerate these miracles because they are trumpeting the great importance of Jesus as a divine savior. Likewise with the resurrection appearances, right? Mark, in its original form, Mark never says that Jesus appeared to his followers after rising from the dead. Uh, the later Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, all say that he did, but they're totally inconsistent about whom did he appear to first. Did he appear to Thomas? Did he appear to James? Did he appear to Mary Magdalene? Did he speak to Mary Magdalene? Did he appear in Jerusalem? Did he appear in Galilee? They're all over the map, right? So into this, into this you know, first basket, we can throw the resurrection appearances. Likewise, his claims of being divine and his disquisitions about his relationship to the Father, right? If you, if you see me, you see the Father, right? In my Father's house, there are many rooms. Uh, this notion that he is somehow specially a son of God, that he is God, that he has a, a, a special relationship to God. Uh, Jesus only says these things in John. He doesn't say them in earlier Gospels. And I'll, I'll talk about that more uh, later. Uh, but these sorts of claims about himself as being divine and his special relationship to God, that goes into the first basket. Also, the identities of his disciples, okay, and I'll talk about the disciples more later. They're, they're significant. But who were his closest followers? The Gospels provide lists of who his closest followers were, and they're all different. Right? And a bunch of them show up in only one gospel and not the others. They're totally, they're totally inconsistent. So the identities of his disciples and also the identities of other close friends. 
you know, Lazarus is only mentioned in John, uh, Mary uh, and Martha of Bethany are only mentioned in John. All of these are very doubtful. Okay. So that's a lot of significant things, you know, miracles, resurrection, virgin birth, that's a lot of stuff we can throw into basket A. And there are other things too we can throw in, into, basket, uh, into basket A uh, that are borderline. You know, did he have a father named Joseph? You know, doesn't appear in all the Gospels. Uh, it's, it's, it's questionable, but it at least has a somewhat better chance of being historically accurate than, than that sort of first basket that I just threw things into. Okay, how about the second basket? The second basket is things that do appear strong according to our rigorous historical criteria. Things that are attested early, usually in the first source that we have, that are attested consistently among multiple sources, that are corroborated also by our knowledge of the Roman Empire, of ancient Judea and Galilee, and by archaeology. Okay, what can we put into this second basket? Jesus was a Jewish man. He was a peasant. He lived in the town of Nazareth in Galilee, which is the northern region of Palestine, on sort of the northern edge of Judea. So he was from Nazareth. Uh, he was baptized by John the Baptist. He preached publicly and had followers. He went to Jerusalem during the Passover holiday. While in Jerusalem, he caused some disturbance, which led to him being arrested and condemned by the Roman prefect, Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He had among his followers a close group of 12 disciples, and I'll talk more about that later, which not all scholars would totally agree with, but it's fairly strong. And shortly after he died, some of his followers quickly came to believe that he had resurrected from the dead. Okay, I'm going to talk about each of these a little more. But before I talk about these, I'm going to point out something that ought to be obvious. If we compare basket A to bas basket B, what's the difference? Well, when we look at basket A, the things that are very weak and dubious claims about Jesus. They're all miraculous, right? They're all pointing out something extraordinary, exceptional about Jesus that uh, we today would call supernatural, right? Something about his divinity, the virgin birth, the miracles, resurrection, uh, and also some, some details about his social circle go into basket A. Basket B are all totally normal, ordinary, unremarkable things about a Jewish peasant of the first century AD, right? So when we do our rigorous historical comparison, what we end up finding is a Jesus who is totally historically plausible and believable according to our normal everyday beliefs about ordinary people. Okay, he was one Jewish peasant among hundreds of thousands. Uh, he was illiterate. He was a manual worker, a craftsman. He came from Nazareth. Okay, Nazareth is a small village. Uh, for a long time, there was no known archaeological or textual corroboration of the existence of any village called Nazareth. Our only source for, for hundreds of years saying that such a town existed was the New Testament. And for that reason, some uh, scholars questioned in the 19th and 20th centuries, questioned whether there was a Nazareth at all, or if it was uh, an invention of the church. Well, uh, since that time, inscriptions have been found on uh, a synagogue, and also archaeological remains have been found that confirm that there was a village in Galilee, in the location that these other sources say uh, was the location of Nazareth. So that, that is one early example of these sort of fuzzy, 
doubtful claims in the New Testament being corroborated by archaeology. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and some scholars would tell you if you really want to pare down to just the most certain facts about Jesus, uh, they would say that the only really sure facts we can say about Jesus are that he was baptized by John the Baptist and he was crucified. Right. So this is one of our most certain. We know that there was a person called John the Baptist, uh, he is spoken about in Josephus and in other sources. He was a, a sort of spiritual revivalist among Jews who uh, baptized Jews in the Jordan River and who apparently, it seems, was also an apocalyptic prophet and preacher anticipating a coming uh, apocalypse and kingdom of God. One of the reasons why scholars are very certain this really happened is because it doesn't fit with the ideological agenda saying that Jesus was the Messiah. If you see Jesus as the Messiah and a divine figure, then you would say that Jesus baptized his followers. You wouldn't say that John baptized Jesus. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why people are very confident that that really happened. Uh, he preached and had followers. Uh, this was not unique. There were many Jewish uh, miracle workers, preachers, prophets, traveling around Judea in the Second Temple period, preaching all sorts of moral and theological messages, and often expecting some sort of apocalypse. Uh, and, you know, recent scholars from the Jesus Seminar forward, many scholars have pointed out other examples that you can unearth in our surviving sources that show that there were other people like Jesus in this way. Uh, he went to Jerusalem during Passover. That was totally common. It was, a, it was common to go to Jerusalem as a pilgrimage during the Passover holiday. And you might know, Passover is the holiday that commemorates the Jewish exodus out of slavery in Egypt. So it celebrates the Jewish God's liberation of the Jews from oppression and foreign rule. So going to Passover, going to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover was something many Jews did and did it particularly as a way of challenging and antagonizing the Roman rulers, right? And the Roman government in Palestine was constantly worried and had to station lots of troops and lots of officials in Jerusalem to watch out and be careful that a, uh, a rebellion, a Jewish rebellion, didn't break out during Passover, right? And hence it makes it... It makes sense, although we might not be totally certain about the details, it makes sense that Jesus caused some disturbance, maybe at the temple, uh, that drew the attention of the Roman authorities and led to him being arrested and crucified. Okay? Crucifixion was the customary Roman punishment, not for any crime and not for heresy, but for uh, rebellion. Right? Rebellion and sedition against Roman authority led to people being crucified. Right? The uh, Gospels specifically claim that Jesus was condemned and crucified under the orders of uh, a Roman official called Pontius Pilate. Now, Pontius Pilate was a Roman official, but like many mid-level Roman officials, there's very little documentation about him. And the only uh, Roman documents and histories that even mention him come from a good deal later, the end of the first century, second century. We'll briefly refer to the existence of Pontius Pilate. Some scholars, again, like with Nazareth, some scholars theorized sometimes that there was no Pontius Pilate, uh, that he was sort of a amalgam figure, a sort of imagined Roman uh, villain that Jews talked about, uh, and that uh, the Christians sort of just talked about Pontius Pilate as, as just their sort of generic uh, Roman bad guy. Uh, but in the 1960s, archaeologists discovered uh, a theater, uh, ruins of a theater in the city of Caesarea, which is the Roman, uh, the main Roman city in Palestine. Uh, and in, in this theater, they found a cornerstone uh, paying homage to the prefect of Palestine, Pontius Pilate, right? So this, this stone, so-called the so-called uh, Pilate Stone, in the theater in Caesarea is uh, 
an archaeological corroboration of the existence of a prefect called uh, called Pontius Pilate, and it lends greater credence both to the gospel accounts and also to these other non-Christian authors who mentioned Pontius Pilate and said he was a very uh, uh, repressive and antagonistic Roman ruler who often upset the Jews, right? So here we have different documentary sources and, uh, and archaeology corroborating one another. Okay, so we can say with a great deal of confidence Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate. Now, there are a couple of other sort of uh, slightly more marginal topics that I mentioned before that uh, are not as firmly in this basket, but that most scholars would tend to agree are very likely true. One of them is that Jesus had 12 disciples, so that from among his followers, he picked out a special group of 12 with whom to share uh, his most important or most sensitive teachings. Among those teachings may have been the notion that he himself was the Messiah. And as I said in the last lecture, in our earliest known gospel, Mark, Jesus implies and intimates that he might be the Messiah. His, some of his close disciples deduce this, and Jesus does not contradict them when they come to this conclusion. It is possible that that assertion in Mark is totally historically accurate. It's also possible that that was that idea was cooked up and developed in some time between the death of Jesus around AD 30 and the writing of the Gospel of Mark around AD 70. Uh, that's an open question. Did Jesus think of himself as the Messiah? Did his followers think of him, him as the Messiah at a time when he was living? Uh, open open to question but the 12 disciples are significant and i'll get back to those uh later in a, in a minute uh the resurrection as i said the accounts of how jesus's followers knew that he was resurrected what they saw in the tomb when and where they saw jesus himself is totally inconsistent from one gospel to another. However, they are, they are all at least consistent in saying that very soon, almost immediately after Jesus' death, they came to believe that he had resurrected. Is this because they found an empty tomb? Well, some have argued that that's possible, that Jesus might have been taken down off the cross uh, and put into a tomb when he wasn't really dead yet, and that he later, you know, got up and walked out. Uh, that certainly is possible. Uh, some have pointed out that, you know, a Roman soldier gives water to Jesus while he's on the cross, according to one gospel. Uh, it's possible that that might have also been a drug or an anesthetic to knock him out, but that he wasn't really dead. That is possible. It's also possible that there was no tomb at all, that that whole idea was simply invented and added in later to give more drama and more dignity to Jesus' death and resurrection. The normal policy among Romans was to simply leave you on the cross forever until your remains were gone and, you know, went to the elements. Uh, so maybe this whole idea of the tomb was all an invention, and that didn't really uh, even happen. Uh, that's what Bart Ehrman argues. There probably was no tomb. You know, we don't know. Uh, so that's all very fuzzy, but what we can say is that the idea of the resurrection uh, arose very quickly and spread among Jesus' close followers. And some have pointed out, again, uh, with some plausibility, have pointed out that uh, when a person dies suddenly or tragically, it's quite common for their close loved ones who are traumatized to have dreams or visions of that person and to even have what we might call hallucinations where they see and speak with that person as their mind sort of uh, reaches after closure okay so if we bear that in mind it's completely possible that followers of Jesus had such visions or hallucinations and came to believe that Jesus had 
resurrected from the dead, and that this idea fit very easily into their belief system, because the idea of the resurrection of the dead is a very common idea in Judaism. Not all Jews subscribe to it, but for thousands of years many Jews have subscribed to it, and it was a common idea in the Second Temple period that at some point God would uh, resurrect the dead, and that would be part of this apocalypse uh, and and process of ending the world and bringing in the kingdom of God. So when Jesus' followers uh, saw him in whatever way or whatever capacity, when they saw him, they very quickly uh, came to the, the belief that Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, that he was the first person that God had chosen to raise from the dead and that all the other dead of humankind would follow. Okay, so, so here's again, just to, just to run over it again, here's what we can say with a pretty strong degree of confidence about Jesus, that he was a Jewish peasant from a town called Nazareth, he was baptized by John the Baptist, he took up preaching and gathered followers. From among those followers, he picked out 12 particularly important ones, that he went to Jerusalem during Passover, caused some disturbance in Jerusalem, which caused him to be arrested, condemned, and crucified, and that shortly after his death by crucifixion, his followers came to believe that he had risen from the dead. Okay. So that's our basic outline of what we can say fairly surely about Jesus. But as I said before, there's a lot more detail in the New Testament that has been examined and that different scholars have argued has some uh, historical credibility to it to some degree, to varying degrees. And that as recent uh, scholarship has progressed, more and more items, claims that we can see in the early Christian writings have gotten some sort of corroboration or have been cast in a new light that gives them a bit more credence than they had before. Uh, Jesus' apocalyptic prophecies, uh, his frequent reference to an approaching uh, son of man, uh, which would uh, overthrow the earthly powers, particularly, of course, the Romans, and also the temple, and usher in a kingdom of God, this uh, has been taken up by scholars as very likely to be a real core message in Jesus' preaching. One of the passages that scholars have pointed to as having a good deal of credibility is where Jesus says uh, to his followers, uh, the, the kingdom of God is coming, and indeed many of you in your own lifetimes before this generation is passed, we'll see the kingdom of God. Why is that considered very likely to be an accurate utterance of Jesus? Because by the time the Gospels were collected and written down, people could see it wasn't true. There was still no kingdom of God. They were still waiting. There hadn't been anything like the apocalypse Jesus had prophesied. And it's very unlikely that people would have put these prophecies into Jesus's mouth that called into question his credibility, right? And that would really cause headaches for Christian apologists for 2,000 years afterward. Uh, it's very likely he really said that, and that when he really said it, it made a powerful impression on the people who heard it. And hence, they passed this prophecy down and insisted it be included because they remembered Jesus had said it. Okay. Uh, did he believe that he was messianic, and did he preach that he was the Messiah? Well, uh, scholars could look at the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus intimates or implies that he's the Messiah, and say, that's probably not true. He probably never did it or said it. Uh, it was attributed to him later by people who believed he was the Messiah. Well, that's believable, but there are certain aspects, certain claims that we can see in the Gospels that actually tend to suggest it's more likely true that Jesus did think of himself as being the Messiah. One of the facts, one of the claims we can point to in 
the Gospel accounts that tends to suggest that he did think of himself as being the Messiah is the disciples. So all of the different Gospels give us different lists of who these disciples were, but all of them consistently say there were 12, right? This seems to be an important fact that all the later followers of Jesus insisted on remembering. He picked out 12 special followers to be his inner circle. Why 12? Well, Jewish apocalyptic teachings said that when the kingdom of God arrived, ar arose, the earthly human governments would be overthrown and new leaders and new judges would be put in place to govern in the name of God as representatives of God. And what are there 12 of? There are 12 tribes of Israel, right? The Jewish people traditionally see themselves as belonging to 12 tribes. The 12 disciples appear to be the people that Jesus picked out and prepared to take up this role of acting as judges and rulers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, and if, and if these 12 disciples would be the rulers of the 12 tribes, who was Jesus? Jesus was the king of all the Jews. He was their leader, right? And as king, king of the Jews, he was the Messiah, the anointed one. Okay, so it does seem likely all in all that Jesus uh, really thought of himself as the Messiah and that uh, when Jesus was arrested and condemned, it was not because he was speaking blasphemy or, you know, knocking over tables, which maybe he did or maybe not. Uh, it's possible he did that. But he was arrested and condemned because he was telling his followers that he was the king of the Jews. And as doing so, by doing so, he was challenging Roman authority over Palestine. Okay. There are also claims made about Jesus and his life that tend to go against, that tend to contradict the later theological ideas about Jesus as the Messiah, and hence have a good chance of being, um, of being true. One is the fact that he had a family, okay? Read the Gospels. He had a mother and father and brothers and sisters, right? And one of them is specifically named in Paul and in Josephus, his brother James, okay? That doesn't really fit with the later theological teachings of the church that Jesus was fathered by God uh, and that uh, Mary was a virgin, okay? Doesn't really fit, Um uh, and yet, it's there in our earliest documents about Jesus. So it's very likely that, that the family is real. Uh, the baptism by John the Baptist, as I said before, very likely to be historically real. Uh, also, certain utterances that we can see uh, that don't fit the prevailing theological views of the church, particularly the views propounded by Paul about... Uh, salvation and eternal life through faith, okay? For example, the parable of the sheep and the goats. There's a parable attributed to Jesus where he says, uh, when, uh, when the Son of Man arrives, he will sort out the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left hand. And when asked why, how and why are you sorting out the sheep from the goats and giving the sheep salvation and the, the goats damnation or condemnation, he will say, well, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was, uh, when I was naked, you clothed me. And the sheep will ask, well, when did we do these things? We never remember seeing you. And the Son of Man will say, well, whenever you fed a hungry person, that was me. Whenever you clothed a naked person, that was me. You didn't know it. But, you know, as you do to the least of these, so you do to me. Right? Okay, this is a, a parable that sets out the criteria by which the Son of Man is going to sort out the saved from the damned. 
and the criterion is their conduct, right? How they have treated one another and how they have treated the weak and the poor. That's how you sort out who is saved and who is damned. Well, this goes against Paul's theology and the prevailing general point of view of the Orthodox Church, which is that uh, everyone is bad, everyone is sinful, right? No one can live up to the law. Everyone's conduct is bad. It is, but people are saved purely by grace as a free, unearned gift, right? According to the parable of the sheep and the goats, certain people have earned salvation and, cer and others have not. So this, because it doesn't fit with the prevailing teachings about salvation that were common to the church at that time, it's very likely that Jesus really said the parable of the sheep and the goats and that people who remembered it passed it on, okay? And the, the fact that we can find certain parables, certain utterances attributed to Jesus that have a high degree of being historically accurate, that has certain implications. Namely that Jesus probably really did teach in parables, right? That, that even if we don't know if all of them are true or all of them are accurate to Jesus, we can say with some moderate degree of confidence, it's very likely that Jesus did teach using metaphors and stories and riddles, and that some of these were passed down by his followers, and others may have been made up and attributed to him because the followers knew that this is the way Jesus tended to speak and to teach. Okay, scholars have also used linguistic evidence to look more closely at the claims about Jesus and sort out what is credible and what is not. Um, for example, there's a conversation that Jesus holds. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have at my fingertips which gospel it's in, but I'm sure we can find it. Um, there is a, a conversation that Jesus has in the gospels that is the origin of the term born again. And it's, a conversation where Jesus, that is very, that doesn't make sense in English. It's weird when we read it in English. But Jesus basically says, I tell you, you cannot be saved unless you are born again. And his followers ask, that, that makes no sense. How can you be born again or born twice? And Jesus says, well, you can be born on earth of a woman but you must also be born spiritually in the heavens, right? Now, this sounds sort of odd in English because it seems like a non sequitur. You know, first he's saying born again or born twice, like in time. And then he's saying you, you need to be born in two places, on earth and in heaven. Well, what he's doing is he's making a little pun because in Greek, in Greek, the word for above and the word for again is the same. So when you say, I tell you you must be born again, that also simultaneously means you need to be born above. And he explains, I'm, I'm saying you need to be born spiritually in the heavens. So the sort of uh, oddness or non sequitur of this conversation makes sense in Greek because in Greek there's this ambiguity to the word, this double meaning. Okay, well... That means that that conversation was originally composed. It was had and composed in Greek, right? It makes sense in Greek. It doesn't make sense in Aramaic. That ambiguity or double meaning doesn't exist in Aramaic or in Hebrew for that matter. So what that means is this conversation almost surely didn't happen or it didn't happen between Jesus and his followers who spoke Aramaic and maybe knew some Hebrew. Rather, it was invented sometime later by a follower who spoke Greek, right? So this is the sort of linguistic analysis scholars can do to sort out, okay, here are some things Jesus likely said or didn't say. In contrast, there are passages, although all the Gospels were written in Greek by Greek speakers, there are passages in, with lines in Aramaic, right? And in some places that Aramaic has been translated into Greek, also, there are some passages where th that simply include the Aramaic phrase. For instance, most importantly in Mark, uh, 
the Gospel of Mark says when Jesus was on the cross, his last words were Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means God, God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, and that is the way it's recounted in Mark. It's written out in Aramaic. And then the author says, in Greek, what that means is, God, God, why have you forsaken me? So why would the author of Mark include this last line in Aramaic, knowing that his audience didn't understand Aramaic? Why would they include it unless that was really what they had actually been told and that it actually went back to Jesus, who was an Aramaic speaker. Okay, so there's a very high degree of confidence that Jesus really said that. Now, there are other Gospels that say, that attribute different last words to Jesus. You know, Father, to, I commend my soul to you, for example, in, into your hands, which is in Luke. Um, those are all much less credible. I mean, really, if you want based on our sources, if you want to know what did Jesus actually say on the cross, it's very likely that he actually said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is a totally understandable thing to say if you're a you know worshiper of the Jewish God and you're being crucified. You would probably be upset and saying, Jewish God, you were supposed to be protecting me. So there are particular items that we can pick out that are, that are very likely to be true based on linguistic uh, evidence and others that are unlikely to be true. Okay. Now, okay, a couple last things I'll, I'll point out. Um, there are certain other passages, specific claims, specific claims and passages about Jesus that for many years scholars have sort of overlooked or brushed aside as unlikely to be credible, but that are being bolstered um, by, uh, by archaeology. And this is particularly the case when it comes to the Gospel of John. So John was the last of the four canonical, canonical Gospels to be written. Uh, John, uh, hence, you know, d does not have great historical credibility in general. It was written later. It has a clear theological agenda to it. Uh, however, John was also, it was clearly written by Greek-speaking Jews in Judea who knew the geography of, of Judea and of places where Jesus had supposedly been in great detail. Uh, they know the city of Jerusalem and the geography around it better than the earlier gospel writers. Uh, they also know places around Judea and Galilee, and there are specific place names found in John, like Bethany, uh, which is uh, in um, the Decapolis area, I believe, over on the eastern edge of Palestine. Uh, there are place names like this that, that historians traditionally overlooked and said, you know, there's no particular reason to think these are real places. But since that time, new documents and archaeological discoveries have corroborated that those places are real and that they are plausibly places where Jesus might have gone in his journey to Jerusalem. Uh, so John is being sort of given a new lease on, uh, a new lease on life, a new second look by scholars as possibly containing useful historical information. And an, a very dramatic example of this, which a professor at, at Columbia pointed out, was uh, in the first chapter of John, uh, one of Jesus' followers, Philip, finds his friend Nathaniel. And he tells Nathaniel, come and see this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, he's a wonder worker. Uh, he's, he, and, he, and he has a message you should hear. So he's trying to recruit Nathaniel into the Jesus group, basically. And Nathaniel, according to John, Nathaniel responds, Ugh, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip persuades him and says, well, come, you know, come and find out. So this is a funny little exchange that maybe just reflects uh, the notion that the gospel writer had that Nazareth was a sort of small, insignificant town, right? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And yet... Uh, 
the way it's described in the gospel, you know, Nathaniel is, is initially resisting or dismissing the idea that an important teacher or miracle worker could be coming from, from Nazareth. There's, there's, there's some reason why that little exchange seemed to be important enough to include in the Gospel of John. Well, in recent years, uh, a, a shop owner in northern uh, Israel, in what was Galilee, near the archaeological site of Nazareth, started trying to excavate and shore up the foundations of his shop, and he found large tunnels under the ground. And when he went into the tunnels, he found that they were the ruins of a large Roman bathhouse. And the existence of this Roman bathhouse in Nazareth indicates that Nazareth was a Roman garrison town, right? It was a small village. There would have been no need, no market for such a Roman bathhouse unless there were Roman troops stationed there. And archaeologists now believe that probably Nazareth was the main Roman garrison for Galilee. So when Nathaniel says, ugh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's saying that because that's where the Roman soldiers come from. Okay, so suddenly this little exchange in the first chapter of John takes on a whole new significance, which makes it suddenly make a lot more sense why that line was remembered and included in the gospel. Okay, so this is another example of, of the way archaeology is bringing a lot of these claims in the Gospels into a new light and helping them to fit into a larger, uh, plausible historical picture. Similarly, with the plotline of the prodigal son, so you may know the story of the prodigal son where Jesus says uh, he's talking about sin and salvation. And he says, imagine a man with two sons. One of them is loyal and works in his household. The other one takes his inheritance, runs off, and spends it like a, like a maniac. But then he's, he's, he's poor, he's broke, you know, he's broken down, and he despairingly goes back to his father and asks to be accepted again. And his father embraces him and takes him back into the family. And Jesus seems to tell this story as a kind of metaphor for uh, sinful, wayward people who need to be welcomed into the church. Okay, uh, scholars traditionally looked at the prodigal son and said, well, this storyline, it sounds an awful lot like Roman dramas. You know, it sounds like a Roman uh, plot line by Terence or, or Plautus. It's, um, you know, it's this family drama uh, about, you know, and somebody gets redeemed and, and it, 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 it just, it, it it sounds like something that later followers of the Jesus group might have made up as a dramatization of Jesus' teachings and put into his mouth. Okay. Well, archaeologists have found that in uh, Sephoris, which is the larger town, sort of metropolitan town just north of Nazareth, they found that there is a Roman theater in Sephoris, and this Roman theater was built in the early first century AD, around the time uh, that Jesus supposedly lived. And the Gospels say that Jesus and his father Joseph were tekton, which is a Greek word for a, a craftsman, right? And sometimes English speakers say, well, he was a carpenter, but basically it's just saying he was a craftsman or a builder of some sort. And if that's true, it is very likely that Joseph and Jesus would have worked on construction projects in Sephoris, that they would have worked on this Roman theater, building it, and probably also on building sets for performances in this theater. And when you consider that, it's completely plausible that Jesus uh, could have heard uh, or seen rehearsals or performances of Roman plays at this theater in the neighboring town of Sephoris. So there is no reason, historically speaking, there is no reason to think that Jesus didn't actually tell this parable of uh, the prodigal son and that he might have been inspired by the plot lines and sort of formulas of Roman drama. Uh, 
And this is one example of a sort of adjustment in thinking scholars have done about Jesus, where the more we look at his life, the more we can see uh, or look at evidence about his time and place, the more we can see Jesus very likely knew all sorts of people, Greeks, Romans, Samaritans, Jews of different parties and sects, and that he was very much uh, aware and intellectually literate of this complicated world, and he was aware of power and politics and wealth and poverty, and that a lot of his, uh, a lot of his teachings, which may plausibly might go back to the Q document, concern power and wealth and poverty, and uh, the destructiveness of greed and money, and uh, and the nobility of poverty, because he was living in a very complicated, class-stratified, and politically stratified world, and he was actually reacting to it. Okay. So that is basically uh, the new sort of insights about Jesus and the historical Jesus that scholarship and archaeology have brought us up to, uh, up to today. So this has already been a very long lecture, so I shouldn't go on much longer, but I'll briefly comment on an idea that sometimes comes up in popular discussions about the historical Jesus that I'll just briefly address, but I shouldn't get too into it, and you know I can maybe talk about it more later if people are interested. But uh, you'll sometimes hear the idea put forward that there was no Jesus at all, right? That Jesus was, this is called the mythicist, argument, the idea that Jesus was not an actual person at all, but that he was this sort of divine, uh, in this mythical divine god or hero figure that the church then later falsely claimed was an actual flesh and blood person who walked around on the ground. Okay, the mythicists tend to see the supernatural elements of the story of Jesus as absolutely integral, right? They consider it implausible that an ordinary peasant man could have started a religion, basically, could have been the founder of this massively successful church. Okay, so there's a there's a tinge of elitism to this, this mythicist point of view. The idea that an, an ordinary peasant couldn't be so striking or so impressive in his words or in actions that he could have started a movement, and much less a you know an, an illiterate nobody. Uh and yet, you know, our sources say he was an illiterate nobody. You know, that's what our historical evidence says. Um, and they tend to believe that, you know, if you, if you believe there was any Jesus at all, that any Jesus of Nazareth existed at all, then you must therefore believe in Jesus Christ's superstar. You must then take on all these miracle stories and the resurrection and the virgin birth. And yet, as I've shown, as I've pointed out here, if you sort out what are the consistently attested claims about Jesus, they are all ordinary plausible facts about a Jewish man at that time. The ones that are implausible and all over the map are the miraculous ones, right? Those are the ones that are inconsistent, that are not attested in our earliest document, and that are dubious. So, to subscribe to the mythicist idea, you have to somehow imagine that people had a shared idea of a divine, godly, heroic, mythical Jesus, and they then made up an ordinary life story for him. But if that's true, then if that were true, then the miraculous claims should be consistent across our sources. And the ordinary biographical claims, like what was the village he came from, what was his parents' names, okay? Uh, how did he die? Those things should be inconsistent, right? Now, as historians looking back over history, we can see it is not at all unusual for ordinary people, regular men and women, to attract attention, and then after they're dead, to accrue stories and myths about them, okay? I already talked about how this happens with George Washington, right? The George Washington story about he chopped down a cherry tree and he had wooden dentures, those are false, right? Those are false myths that have accrued to that person. But the fact that those myths are false does not mean there was no George Washington, 
Okay, There was definitely a George Washington, it's just you can't believe all the extraordinary stories that are told about him. Okay, This is not, uh, there, there are many examples of this, there are more recent examples. Okay, I recall in grade school, I recall being told that Einstein and Picasso were the only two people in the world who could draw a perfect circle freehand. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? Doesn't that show how exceptional and how brilliant Einstein and Picasso were? But it's false, okay? That, and it took me years of figuring out to remember that and think, that, that, there's no way that's true. <laughs> Einstein and Picasso, they're iconic, they're famous, people like to talk about their genius and their personalities. And so they attribute this false myth to them, right? Um, it's not true. However, uh, that doesn't mean that Einstein and Picasso aren't real people who really lived. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a grain of truth, okay? And the grain of truth that I have found is there are some biographers of Picasso who say that Picasso would instruct his students to draw a circle freehand. And they would do it very sloppily and imperfectly, and Picasso would point out, look at how you all did this imperfectly, and that shows your individuality. Your mistakes are what make you uh, distinctive and unique. Okay, so there may be a grain of historical truth, but the myth keeps getting blown up, right? It makes perfect sense to think that this is what happened with Jesus, okay? Now, when we look at our earliest documents about about Jesus, the earliest references to Jesus that we have are in Paul, right? Paul's letters. And Paul says things that, that, I, um, that I pointed out. You know, he was a Jewish man, he had a brother, he was crucified, he was buried, okay? These all seem to be things that an ordinary earthly human would do, or could happen to an ordinary earthly human. Mythicists sometimes go through this and they poke holes in each of these claims. And they say, oh, well, he was buried, but, uh, but Paul says that in his vision he saw uh, paradise in the heavens. And paradise is a garden, so Jesus maybe was in the heavens and he was buried in this garden in the heavens. Well, yeah, you, you could say that, but it's a really stretched interpretation, right? And this is what mythicists tend to do. They take all of these, this pile of different evidences about who Jesus was and what he did as a man in his life in the first century. And they try to somehow twist it around and with each one say that it doesn't necessarily mean he was a real person. It could all be somehow looked at upside down and sideways to say that he was a heavenly figure, right? And it's very important for them to make this argument about Paul because Paul is the earliest source we have. Right? And they'll often also rely on claims about interpolations. They'll take passages from these documents about Jesus and say, well, they're not real. They were added in later. Right? They were interpolated. And then, for example, they'll argue that the entire uh, paragraph about Jesus in Josephus that I read to you, that all of that was interpolated. Right? Now, with each of these individual claims, it's possible you know, it's possible that maybe Paul meant Jesus was buried in heaven. It's possible that Jesus uh, meant he was crucified in some divine metaphorical way. It's possible that the entire passage in Josephus is an interpolation. Each of these things is possible, but it's not at all plausible that they're all somehow not what they seem. That everything is somehow a distortion. Everything doesn't mean what it says, right? And even if you credit every one of those claims and arguments and say all of them might be true, st even still, by Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is that there was a guy named Jesus of Nazareth who had followers, and that after he died, things were exaggerated or embellished about him, which developed over time into the Jesus Christ that we know in Christianity. Okay. So by Occam's razor, it's simply simplest to say the sources we have are not entirely reliable. Certain things in them might be true or false. But that if we examine our sources critically, we can come to certain basic facts that we know about this person, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. 
He was an apocalyptic preacher. He was concerned with wealth and poverty. He had followers who included Jews, Gentiles, men and women, prostitutes, uh, other disfavored people in the society of his time. And that he went to Jerusalem and he presented a threat to Roman authority in Palestine, which led to him being crucified. Okay, This is the bare, sketchy Jesus of Nazareth that we can talk about. And my hope is that uh, people can have a productive conversation about trying to understand the historical Jesus, which is independent from one's Christian uh, faith and, and one's belief in Jesus Christ as, as a Christian. Uh, and that scholarship and archaeology can continue to give us new information and new insights, which might give us an even clearer and richer picture of this of this impactful person uh, whom we still know as Jesus. So thank you again for listening. Uh, if you can offer any support, again, I urge you to take a look at my Patreon page, also under Historian Splaining. The link will be in the description. Uh, and if you have topics or questions you want me to address, please email me at historiansplaining at gmail.com or comment on SoundCloud. Thank you. Oh, lift him up, that's all, lift him up in his voice. If you tell